along. Um, we've been looking at models and potential vaccines, uh, working with teams globally on the MERS vaccine. Now, let's talk about SARS and MERS as two of the, the nasty cousins of COVID-19. Uh, SARS has a fatality rate of 25%. So, and also anyone who got it got seriously ill. And a lot of our colleagues in the health sector were the ones that got really sick. It shut down the Singapore healthcare system and it also went to Canada and Toronto. So there's no sort of reason why Singapore was not quick to act when the coronavirus came through. Um, and it cost $40 billion alone in Toronto for that outbreak. We're talking only a handful of deaths, about 15 um, or so deaths, and that's what that created. So we weren't war we were warned, okay? MERS, even nastier, 45% death rate, it hit uh, South Korea. So again, no question why South Korea was quick to jump onto the coronavirus when it appeared. Members of my team and international colleagues were working in a place called Southern China um, and looking for these viruses. We've also been looking for these viruses across Australia and Australian wildlife. And shock horror, coronaviruses are fairly common. Um, and certainly they're carried by a number of animals. In particular, the bat is the one that's the primary. You can't catch this from bats. So, um, but you can catch it from an intermediary. Now, one thing to remember is talking to farming people, 60% of all infectious diseases come from animals, from humans. And in fact, 75% of all the new infections, so we're talking Zika, Ebola, we're talking a whole range of other infections that are actually coming through to do this. And the frightening fact here is, is that here's a nice long list of how things are actually getting worse. Now, they're getting worse in the sense of this one here. Hendra, it's a good homegrown one. Hendra, or the Hennepin nipper ones are the ones to really be scared of. Anyone who's seen the film Contagion, that's based on the nipper virus. Now, I can give you a little bit of good hope there. Our team down in Geelong has actually got some fledgling vaccines for the, for the nipper virus at the moment. 45% death rate. We had a big blast in, uh, in Malaysia um, about five or six years ago. So um, you need to be scared about this. Things are changing. Flu, I was down in the health department when the swine flu came through and I'm pretty excited that I managed the second index case. Um, but we seem to be a bit complacent about flu in the sense of actually where it is. It kills thousands of Australians every day, every, sorry, every year, um, which is a challenge. So understanding this virus, now because of genomics, we can actually track these things right back with a great degree of certainty. We know what a fabricated virus would look like. We know that if someone made a virus in a laboratory, we actually know what it would look like. Because um, you can tell, there's telltale signs about when people have been doing genetic manipulation. Now, do we trust the Chinese? No. Were the Chinese doing this? No. Um, because colleagues of mine actually went to Wuhan on that uh, WHO mission to actually look at where it was and what was going on. If the Chinese are guilty of anything, it's in fact actually not taking this seriously, or as seriously as they should have at the beginning of this phase. But then the WHO could be accused of that as well. And so could many other countries globally. Um, this emerged from bats to an animal we don't know what at this stage and then went to humans and rapidly roared through sometime in December of uh, 2018, 2019. Now, things that we didn't know. So it often sounds that specialists like myself will say, oh, he's just making up, he's changed his mind, he said that yesterday, he's saying that today, because we're actually learning things every day. And at the start of this pandemic, we really had to actually understand a lot of things. Had it infect you? How sick did it make you? This is a really cunning virus. We've grown to respect this virus so much because it takes around about two to 14 days, but average five to get sick. Okay, you see someone with the flu, you catch the flu, you're sick within two days. With coronavirus, it can be up to two weeks. So that's a problem. So that means that people can spread it around the community without actually knowing that it's sick. The second one, the important part is about 80% are mild or moderate or asymptomatic. And I'm going to come back to long COVID because that's something we're learning. If you do get sick, it takes about, I use the rule of a week, about a week to get infected, about a week to get sick, and then about a week to get really sick and come into hospital. And then another week, if you're really worse, to start to get very unwell. Um, my work colleague uh, is from Ireland and his sister at 55, nothing wrong with her health, has just got out of intensive care or just been extubated. Fit, strong, and she's in an Irish intensive care unit. And this is a this is a trend. I mean, I've got other others with family members that have been in and out of the hospital. This is a serious disease. Now, what does it do to you? It basically sets the scene for your body to start killing you. And the way it does that is it causes blood clots everywhere. It causes blood clots, and in fact, the specialists that I've been dealing with 
in the uh, Royal Melbourne Hospital and the Northern Hospital, they say, we take the blood and it just clot in your hands. It was amazing. They said, you know, and actually this is the problem, this is how it kills you. Opposite to Ebola, which makes you bleed to death. So someone said, some way said to me, I'd go, well, wouldn't you use Ebola to treat COVID? <laughs> <laughs> um, and this is, this is the problem. Um, the death rate at the moment official is uh, somewhere in the 3.5 million globally, but the WHO said uh, a couple of days ago it's probably 10 million because people can't count and people can't do the tests. So it's, uh, this is, the Spanish flu put in cons uh, the perspective had 40 million deaths globally, okay? So we're starting to get to that level. Um, now, what did we do at the start of this? We knew how to manage um, uh, pandemics when they came through. If you do nothing, that's what happens. So that's Wuhan, New York, Northern Italy, Spain at the early stages. They essentially did nothing and it just went way out of control. Um, and what we're seeing in India now. If you do a few things by social distancing, you start to decrease the cases. You have this problem of continued resurgences. Brett Sutton said to me at the start of this thing, I'm a bit worried about the fact we're going for elimination because it means we're going to be sitting ducks because at some stage the virus is going to have to come back. And that's where we are now, um, which is a problem. Okay, it's been fantastic not having to live like anyone else on the planet, but we've still got this problem that the virus is going to be here and it's going to, in fact, inhabit our lives. So if we look at the uh, issue on control, and this is on Australian intensive care bed availability. So if we did nothing, which of course, people aren't stupid, right? They actually, even in countries like Brazil where the president's trying to kill them all, they, um, they in fact actually stayed at home, they social distances and things like this. So people actually are quite sensible. If we quarantined and isolated only doctor there, we still would have exceeded our intensive care bed level. But by going into a whole range and raft of things, which we know we did, we in fact actually did that. What does it mean in re reality? I've been working on some projects with some New York um, emergency physicians, and the point there that they look at, these people look like they've been to the war, okay? They're really like this. Um, and New York really was hammered. What happened there was they had a, if you went to intensive care, you only had a 40% chance of getting out of intensive care. During the peak of the Melbourne surge, you had an 80% chance of getting out of intensive care. That's what this looks like when you've got control of uh, how many cases are around. So that's why we did this, and it was horrible. So we started with thoughts of this, what's going to happen? Are we going to see a big surge and then we'll burn out? No. Are we going to see a big surge and a rest and another surge and then a rest and another surge? Are we going to see an annual surge? Uh, no. We're going to see a big surge and then we're going to see persistence. This disease doesn't really follow a seasonal map. It's worse in winter because we're closer to each other. Um, but it's in fact actually doesn't appear to be seasonal um, and we're stuck with it. It's now made the jump from animals to humans and it likes what it's found and it's going to stay with us. Now the good thing is when viruses do that they tend not to make you too sick to kill you because it wants to spread. So the idea is the virus wants to infect you so you can infect someone else so it can actually spread around the community and the flu's got that nice balance okay. Um, and we have to wait for that balance to happen. The flu jumped from animals to humans maybe 3,000 or so years ago, and it's found a nice little home. Came from chickens, probably about the same time we domesticated chickens, was uh, about the time that flu jumped from animals to uh, humans. Um, this one, probably because through stress of population, we're moving into areas where animals traditionally have been isolated and not actually exposed a lot to humans. Ebola, Zika are two examples of that. And so is uh, probably this uh, coronavirus as well. That uh, if we hadn't been putting pressure on the environment where these animals are living and left them alone, we probably wouldn't have actually seen it. So that's a problem, okay? Persistence. And this is where we are in Australia. We've got zero cases and we have to get to this level. And that's the problem that we actually face. And how is, are we going to do that is the challenge. So, some startling facts. The third leading cause of death in the US in 2020 was COVID-19 and that's up against the big ones, heart disease, cancer. So it almost equaled cancer deaths in the US for that year. That's actually frightening. This is not just a little flu, as you've heard some of the right-wing pundits say, this is actually a serious disease. Um, so what does it mean? And we're gonna come back to these. Gradual easing of lockdown, as you've seen, increasing tests and trace and quarantine, as you've seen. Neighbourhood level lockdowns, we may find we've got one in Northern Melbourne, sort of emerging now, we might find with that. And what's not going to change is all the things you did to get in here. Wash your hands, stay apart, 
and we can't go overseas yet. And of course, we're seeing a lot of debate on that one. Um, I've got, got some answers for you on that as well because we're doing testing. So why does social distancing matter? The less people you're around, the less people catch it. Pretty simple. So if you're having big family gatherings in a building like this, when there's COVID around, there's no COVID around, thank goodness, um, here, not in Northern Melbourne or in Sydney, um, you can in fact say, well, hey, uh, we haven't got um, uh, a chance of actually spreading it. So the lockdown in Melbourne worked well because you really were seeing very few people. That's how it works. And there's evidence. If you come to the Wimmera, that's why I'm in the Wimmera, because there is nobody around you. <laughs> and you can't <laughs> catch it. So that's social distance. Um, now the other part about this social distancing is you think of Swiss cheese. To, for the virus to get to you, social distancing, wearing masks, washing hands, and rapid testing. And no layer on its own will protect this. And you've seen again all this nonsense, oh, we should be wearing masks, oh, it's airborne spread, oh, it's surface spread. You know, it's spread by surface and airborne, and it's also spread by touching people and coughing and speaking to people. Um, you have to have all these barriers. Um, and, and, and I don't know why people keep persisting about all this. It's spread, it's a very infectious virus, very infectious virus. So just to point out with masks, um, my favourite's this one. I call this the old man's <laughs> underpants look. Um, forgive me for all the men in the room, but... Um, <laughs> and we've got a lot of this stuff here, you know, Bunnings Karen was a great example. Um, and, uh, you know, we really shouldn't outlaw stupidity. Um, apart from all those measures, there's three other things you can do to uh, get rid of the virus. We've got vaccines, drugs and tests. We started a pandemic with, well, I'll talk about the vaccine bit in more depth. Uh, a couple of antiviral drugs and a few things like this, but not to COVID and no tests. So we had to invent all of this stuff from January of last year, which is, uh, which is where all the work's been going on. But you'll see this scary part here, 10 to 20 years to develop a vaccine, 10 to 20 years to develop drugs, and three to six years to develop um, tests. And I'll explain the other thing that everyone's worried about is it happened so fast, how did it happen fast? And we'll talk about that. So the normal way of doing a vaccine development takes this amount of time. We do the research into the virus. We then, in fact, you know, test and play with it a bit. Then we start working on uh, what's called preclinical and prototype uh, for vaccine development. And that takes years. Then we move to the various phases of human studies, which you're all aware of. And then we go into the regulator. Now, because we're in the middle of a pandemic that everybody knew was a problem, but because everyone decided this was a serious problem and they threw lots of money at it and lots of resources at it, um, to give you an idea, I was running on um, uh, uh, you smell of an oil rag and, and once this hit, suddenly money appeared for our research and stuff like this from the federal government, shell horror. But so did it happen globally. We were working, um, over the last five years, I knew this was going to happen. And over the last five years, I've been working with international organisations like CEPI, which is the Gates Welcome Trust and the World Economic Forum, who were the only people globally stumping up cash in this area. And we were working on disease X. So we were working on models on how we would in fact actually approach this type of thing. So we didn't start this race without actually having been trained for the Olympics. So we were ready to go. We had a team that was ready to go. It happened and within two weeks we got rid of the work we were doing and we started working on this. So what did we do? We started working with a couple of the um, early contenders that looked really good. And the three that we started looking at was the um, AstraZeneca, or it was Oxford then, AstraZeneca. We started working with Inovio, which you'll see towards the end of the year. And the other one was the UQ, which um, we'll talk about. That one will come back um, once they've taken some uh, work out of it. So we did the animal studies. And we used a ferret model, which we did perfected with SARS. So we had to prove that model, prove the model, got the virus, started working with uh, a couple of vaccine trials. We did three trials at the same time. Normally we did one. We did three. We actually over-pumped our team um, and made them work around the clock seven days a week. As soon as we recognised that the two vaccine candidates were safe, and did their job, they went straight into the human trials, which is, that's where the speed came in. But again, the regulators were actually working with us. So the FDA and the TGA were actually already working with us and getting our information at the beginning. They don't normally do that. So that's where the speed is coming, the administration. The science was not shortened. The science had the same lead time. To give you an idea to do the studies, you're looking at around about uh, one and a half to, uh, to uh, 
up to three months maximum because you do a lot of sub-studies for the preclinical in the animal. Um, the write-up and the paperwork took around about uh, nine to 10, 11 months. That's where the time is. So you're actually doing those together. And we got a lot of criticism from the press because we didn't publish our results. We said, we're not actually interested in publishing those at the moment. We're trying to get our regulatory papers to the FDA so people can use this and start saving lives. That's more important than us getting, um, we have published our articles. Uh, we did a couple of other interesting studies on the um, AstraZeneca one. We, uh, we, we know that it actually uh, pre prevents transmission because we demonstrated that in the animal model. So we're not surprised by the results released last Friday. Um, we also know that if you actually use it as an intranasal vaccine, which may come through, it actually sterilises your nasal passengers and you cannot spread the virus because it can't establish as an infection. In you. So we've already done some of these pieces of work. Um, so that's the uh, beautiful facility there. I remember as a kid in the 70s at the Ag College and they said, oh, they shouldn't bring foot and mouth. Well, we don't. We do do the foot and mouth work, but we do it overseas. We don't do it in there. But that lab is a box in a box in a box in a box. You can't get out of the middle box. In fact, don't even go into the middle box. It's a high secure facility. And when we were dealing with this agent at the beginning, we, um, uh, we actually dealt at this very high level until we understood what we were dealing with and how dangerous it was. So let's talk about the various proteins. What we're looking for is this spike on here and all the vaccines are working against this one. So you can use a protein-based one, which, um, which is the uh, UQ one. UQ is um, a protein uh, trabeculation where uh, one of the proteins seems to react with a HIV test. It doesn't give you AIDS, right? It doesn't give you HIV, but it actually interferes with the test result. They've gone back to the drawing board. Uh, it's, it, it's a very effective vaccine. So they've gone back to the drawing board and we'll probably see that as a Gen 3 vaccine um, when we're talking about boosters and things into the future. The um, viral vector, which is the uh, AstraZeneca one, is where you in fact actually purify the protein and you insert that into what's called the virus to actually take it in. So you actually get infected so the side effects that you're getting from the first AstraZeneca is in fact a um, adenovirus infection. It's not um, related to anything else that's in there. So adenoviruses cause headaches, fevers, rigors, vomiting, uh, belly aches, aches and pains in the muscles and things like that. Because um, adenoviruses are something that actually a lot of us are exposed to. The Chinese ones, uh, Sinovac is also another one like that as well. But the end result is your body produces a spike protein and then you're in fact actually immune. Now the immunity uh, is the important part. Now the mRNA, this is uh, Moderna and Pfizer. What they do is they actually work on coding on the um, what's called the messenger RNA inside the cells and then produces a spike protein. So this is an extremely exciting technology which we've been investigating in cancer therapeutics. Anyone who's got a friend who's had melanoma and knows that nowadays they seem to be able to survive from melanoma because of immunotherapies. If you go further upstream, they're now working on mRNA vaccines for, say, melanoma, breast cancer, and bowel cancer, for instance, where your body will make immunity against those cancers. So this technology is really, really exciting. Um, not only the fact that it's in fact actually works well against the um, uh, coronavirus, but uh, certainly uh, against cancer. I think in my lifetime we might see a cure to a number of cancers because of this technology. Now, there's a lot of stuff people say, oh, it alters your DNA. No, it doesn't. Your DNA is in the centre of the cell. The, uh, RNA, RNA is outside the centre of the cell. It's actually the DNA makes the protein that goes to the messenger RNA, which then tells the cell what to do. That's where it's working. It does not alter your DNA. And that's a common misnomer that many people have had. And so people are worried, oh, it's going to affect my unborn children. No, it's not. Um, and inadvertently, in a lot of the studies that have been done, women have fallen pregnant during, um, uh, during the vaccine trials and have been, um, have, there are no known problems at this stage. Now, the College of OMG has said that if you are pregnant at the moment, uh, it's not advised that you actually have a vaccine. If you're thinking of pregnancy, it's a good idea to get it before you get pregnant. Um, or if you've got high risk um, of having severe complications with COVID and you're pregnant and the rest, they said you should have it. So you can have a look on the College of OMG's website in plain language as to what they say. And breastfeeding, none of these go through the breast milk. So it's not a problem to where we sit. Now, these are the words, the three E's and the H that have driven me completely and utterly freaking nuts, right, over this whole thing. <laughs> efficacy, I'm really excited that everyone's interested in efficacy, but efficacy is a research number. It can't be compared from one vaccine to the other because efficacy is a trial measure. So it's not comparable between them. So you know, we're going, oh, it's 90%, the other one's 80%. 
It's actually meaningless because the studies were different. The studies had different setups and parameters. What it tells us, it works. Anything over 60%, we're going to use guilty. And that's what we were hoping for at the start of this. So that's what efficacy is. So if you see people spouting on about efficacy and talking about that, um, in my opinion, they're a little confused. Um, effectiveness is really what we'll look at, and I'll go into that more deeply. That's how does this vaccine work in the field? How effective is it at stopping people getting sick, and how effective is it at stopping it spreading? Efficiency is what the government likes to see, is uh, how much does it cost us? Um, and at the moment, they don't seem to care about that because we lost 600 billion in the share market on one day alone with this um, pandemic. So I think in one sense, it could cost us quite a lot. Um, so that's, that's what they look at when they're looking at other drugs. So cancer therapies, blood pressure, diabetes drugs, they all go through an efficiency thing before they get approval in the country. This one here drives me completely mad. Anyone here a cow? <laughs> no, I think so. So um, if we think about this, um, and the minute you hear this from someone on TV, Rob's idea of actually when you dis discount anyone's um, expert opinion, the minute they say that word, go, right, no. Nah. There are people coming out of the woodwork. I've been working in this area now for nearly two decades. And we go, don't even know who they are. And they're on the news and they're saying this and they're saying it. You go, who, who is this person? <laughs> who are they? Where are they from? Now, you won't hear that word come out of Sharon Lewin's mouth. I went through uni with Sharon and, and, and we, we do laugh a bit about this. It's hard enough to get herd immunity in your stock. We um, have only sort of achieved uh, what we would call community immunity against measles by having extremely high immunisation rates. Um, and stopping that. That's not even herd immunity, that's, um, that's just sheer persistence and work. We will not achieve herd immunity to coronaviruses. We will have coronavirus outbreaks going on. I'll, I'll eat my hat if I'm wrong. So it's not going to happen, but we do reach a level of immunity that's tolerable um, in the sense that the community will say that's, that's, that's tolerable. We've done that with flu, okay? And, and we, it's tolerable. So in the First instance, we need to get to a very high level of uh, immunity. Now, no one, no one, unless you've had a vaccine, has got immunity to coronavirus. So we're starting from a very low base. That's why you have to get a vaccine um, as soon as possible to get your level up. Once you've got some immunity, um, then you can worry about variants and booster doses and things later. But then at least you're actually um, in the game to actually not get seriously ill or die, which is the important part. That's the thing that hasn't been getting out. You have no immunity until you've had a vaccine. If you get this disease, um, we're going to talk about what your chances are on American data. So let's talk about the effectiveness. I promise to talk about that. There's a lot of reasons why vaccines do or don't work. You might have seen Samoa was talking about how um, they, oh no, sorry, it was the Seychelles. It looks like they've been using um, a Chinese one and the AstraZeneca and they're having breakout um, variants, but we haven't got genomics on that yet. But one of the things that particularly the rural nurses in the community here would know, cold chain. Cold chain is really hard and it's really tough to actually make sure that the vaccines are still viable when you take them around that what you're giving actually works. So that's a real problem um, with in fact actually, you know, the delivery and why it's really so particular about this. And so in fact, in some of those countries where it's quite warm, they may not have been getting vaccines that are effective at all, which is really um, uh, unfortunate. The next one is uh, who believes what and where and how and all those sort of things. The variants, which I'll cover a bit later. Um, the other areas are uh, how sick people are and ethnic differences. There, there may be some uh, ethnic differences in who gets more affected than others. We're, we're still trying to work that one out. And the other one is density, okay? That's, again, the reason why I'm up here. The density is really low. In, in really dense places, this virus really loves it. So if I'm not in Melbourne or an airport, I'm less likely to catch it exciting part about it. All right, this is from American data. This is not from any other sort of company. This is last year's up to January of this year's from the CDC as to the likelihood to die from coronavirus, okay? A developed country with a highly developed healthcare system. So this is the one slide you need to take home and recite these figures in your head. If you are over 75, you have a one in nine chance of dying, not just getting sick, of dying from coronavirus. If you're over 50, you have a 1 in 90 chance of dying, not just getting sick, of dying when you catch coronavirus. And this is the other one. If you're over 30, it's 1 in 900. That's actually really high. That's what's serious about this disease, and that's from America. In India, I started to think what the figures are like. Um, we'll probably never see the true, um, the true numbers that are actually coming from that. Um, 
And that's the reason why we need to take it seriously. Is, is, that, is that frightening figures? The rule of nines. Over 75, one in nine. Over 50, one in 90. Over 30, one in 900. You need to say that to everyone who says to you, oh, it's just a little cold, a little flu. I'll take the chances. I don't think I'll worry about it. It's not going to worry me. Um, yeah, right. So risk. One of my favourite things about risk is, anyone here being struck by lightning? Notice I've got my hand up. I have. Sheet lightning on the Darwin Head Golf Course. It was sheet, which was good. It wasn't fork lightning, which killed a guy on the East Geelong as it bounced around about the same month. Um, did it make any difference to me? No, my golf game was still really bad. <laughs> um, so, uh, in one sense, you would have to be hit by lightning. The death rate from lightning is 1 in 114,000 in the US. I couldn't find the figures for Australia. That is uh, a 1 in 114,000 chance of dying from a lightning strike per year. Pretty cool, eh? <laughs> so that means, now let's compare this to the clot. To die from the clot from the AstraZeneca vaccine in Australia is better than the world. It's actually, it's actually 0.5 per million. In the world, it's one per million. All right, let's put that in perspective. So we're looking at around about 10 lightning deaths. So you'd have to be killed by lightning 10 times to have the same chance of being killed by the clot from the AstraZeneca vaccine, all right? And I don't think you can get killed 10 times. <laughs> now I'm gonna bring it to car accidents, okay? Car accidents, five per 100,000 Australians lose their life in a car accident, still now, with the road toll as low as it is. So we're looking at 50 times killed in a car accident 50 times before you're actually going to get the AstraZeneca clot. So I ask you, why are we worried about this? What's the big concern for us? Um, on the other side of it, if we think about this, everyone's seen the pill, and hopefully not everyone's stopping it now. <laughs> um, the smoking, I hope you are all stopping it. Um, and, and, and this other one, the figure's actually worse than the 16.5. Most of the things I've seen is 20%. One in five people will have a serious <laughs> clot. Now, these are not even just people who've been in intensive care and others. These are kids. So you might get this as a kid and you'll end up with a stroke because coronavirus causes clots, seriously causes clots. Um, and I can tell you one thing when we were doing the animal studies, one thing we were looking for is, are there any untoward effects of the vaccine? You'd better believe it, we looked at it. And the poor animals don't go through the studies like humans. We actually do, do post-mortems on all of them to see what's going on and where and what and how they've been infected. We didn't find any evidence of that at all in the vaccinated lot. So we actually went through that with a fine tooth comb. That's why we moved to human studies. But as you move into very, very large numbers of using a drug or a particular therapeutic, you'll end up finding that um, uh, you will get very rare side effects appearing. That happens, it's a statistical challenge that we've got. All of the drugs that you're on, so your high blood, blood pressure drugs, your heart, other heart drugs, your diabetes drugs, your kidney drugs, all of them have uh, what we call acceptable side effect profiles. Um, and, and a lot of them are much worse than that. So remember that, you'd have to be killed in a car accident 50 times to have the same chance of having a clot. I had an artery one that's low, but I'm still trying to work out what the chances of that are. <laughs> Not very high. And so I went off and had my AstraZeneca, and um, I used to be an associate at Lister House, and um, it was amazing to see Lister House do such an amazing job. They've got a big clinic in there, and they're roaring for them, which is really exciting um, to see how people are actually getting it done. Now, this is something from the comedians who've done really well out of all this, um, and uh, in one sense, um, I'm a little more direct than the, the uh, Federal Health Minister. Um, we're all actually going to wait for Pfizer. You're obviously waiting for the terms to be set up here. He bravely held out until he got his chance for his Pfizer vaccine. Um, and if anything's to remind you that this thing hasn't gone is what's happening in Melbourne now. The virus is here, the virus is going to flare up at some stage and we don't want to be running around trying to find a vaccine at the last hour. Okay, variants, very complex. I've got some extremely smart people working for me, so, so much smarter than I'll ever be. The mathematics on working out the variants where they're coming from and the genomics, um, and uh, they've even worked out formulas to work out which um, variants or mutations, there's only 12,000 genes in the coronavirus, and which mutations will actually be mutations of concern. Which ones will increase the infectivity, which ones will increase the, uh, the death rate. So that's actually now being worked out in real time over this area. We are concerned with the Indian strain, and more strains will continually emerge whilst other countries are completely out of control. So this is a global problem and we need to actually help everybody in the district um, absolutely get immunised and try to
push this virus down hard. If we don't deal with all the countries across the globe, it'll keep emerging um, and uh, you will get hit. To give you an idea of what variants look like in real time, the Spanish uh, flu, uh, we avoided the first wave. The second wave we avoided as well. The troops were held back in, uh, in Europe by, on this pretense that they were helping to rebuild the damaged Europe after the war. Uh, actually, no, they didn't want them to bring Grippy back, which was the Spanish flu at that stage. But wave three came through and had it decimated the Australian population. The fledgling population was about 5 million people, death rate 18 to 20,000 Australians. This was, this was horrific. And many people who actually responded to that as shielding and hiding their kids um, from crowds for up to three or plus years after that. So um, the flu really was damaging. They didn't even know viruses existed then. They thought it was a bacterial infection. Um, and uh, that's what that looks like for us. Wave, everyone keeps talking about waves and waves and waves. Um, we've only had wave one. Wave two is emerging in Brazil and India at the moment. That's wave two. That's what it looks like. It's bigger. Imagine that this won't spread. You spread with a pinpoint bang and you get a case and then it drops down but you actually seed out. And the seeding out, and then when that, that blossoms, that's wave two, which is high, and will knock out 20 to 30% of your population. Wave three is bigger because that time it's seeded a lot and it'll affect the whole population. So India's in wave two, and this is how horrible it is. Can you imagine phase three when it happens in India? It, you just don't even want to think about that. Wave three will, um, will hit us. Um, wave two may get through. Quarantine's been amazing. You see the director of nursing there, the infection rate from, uh, from the, uh, from the uh, operating theatres. If we think about it in this perspective, okay, um, our operating theatres cannot do infection control to the level that our hotel quarantine have done. Hotel quarantine seepage has been uh, minuscule compared to the exposure they've got, but you know, the infection risks in our hospitals and theatres, I just sort of look at this, probably not yours, but you know, <laughs> so many others. Um, in the sense of, in fact, actually the risk of catching infections in hospitals higher um, in that sort of setting, to put in perspective, our quarantine's been phenomenal um, as to where it is, even though it's got a lot of criticism for what they've done. And these are untrained people um, in that setting. We've been asking all sorts of people to do this job, which has been amazing uh, to see how what a great job they've done. All right, what do the variants mean? You will have an annual vaccine. My pick is we'll probably get a variant vaccine offered to us from the beginning of next year. Um, it'll be a different one. It won't be the same one we just had. It'll be completely different. You might find yourself getting a Novio or a Moderna. You might find yourself getting um, uh, a UQ um, uh, later on in the year or something like that. Already they're tweaking the vaccines out on the market for this. Uh, we still don't know whether you could actually get three Pfizer's anyway without actually having side effects. For those of you thinking there's side effect profiles, the first Pfizer are okay, the second one usually it will hang you. AstraZeneca, the first one will hang you, the second one's no real problem, but we still don't know whether we give you a third of either of those yet, we don't know. Um, but what we do know is that they are actually extremely effective. Results from the uh, UK on Friday, very exciting results. Literally 100% reduction in death and serious admission to hospital. Um, uh, and this is a large, large, large sort of in the field. The second thing is um, transmission. After one dose, most people um, have a 65% reduction in transmission of the virus. That's exciting, I can tell you. We saw that in the ferrets. So we're actually seeing that in humans now. So one dose will stop you um, spreading to a high degree. This is really exciting news. So if you want to know where we could be in the future, look at England. No deaths, um, very few serious infections in the hospitals, um, and uh, they're starting to open up again. That's what we could look like in the future. I just want to sort of do a bit of marketing about what we did and uh, why I'm completely wired up and uh, uh, it's been a really, really busy time. I haven't worked this hard my whole career. We started looking at preclinical valuation of vaccines. We started looking at uh, scale up of uh, building vaccines in one of our protein laboratories we've got set up. We're understanding the mutations, as I said. We uh, had to actually build a mass testing facility because shock horror, the imports were not actually up to our standards and didn't work. Um, we actually started the wastewater surveillance, invented a test uh, for sewage to actually find cases and do that, and now that's part of the standard. We fed in, uh, our data people fed in all to the models of the federal government, and we're now doing and have done a lot of the uh, uh, spread research. We've, we've done even more than just aerosolization. We published the first papers on how um, indolent this virus is on surfaces. Probably about 15 to 20 percent of the virus is spread by touch, and the rest is aerosol. So uh, the answer is, if anyone's banging on, oh, they should take this serious or that serious. It's spread both ways. This is a really, really infectious virus. 
So it all came together with us actually doing this, looking at we're actually doing studies on new drugs, um, and we've been working on the protective gear and sterilisation, but more importantly, we've been starting to work on how do we stop this from happening again. Always with toilet humour, you actually show your best work. Our best work is here, and this is how we found the Epping cluster again. So to say that there were really strong positive cases in the sewage of around the Epping, and the uh, health department calls a big warning. That's research going straight to uh, the area of work. Very exciting. So, travel. This cost here is probably much more than that. Anyone who's got family or friends that work in the travel industry, they're already looking at the redundancies that are occurring across the industry. Um, the tourism sector is bleeding like crazy, um, and uh, it's, uh, it's phenomenal what's happening. Uh, probably at the beginning of this, we've got one of our biggest clients is Boeing, and I had some of the best meetings um, that I've ever been to at the start of this pandemic with Boeing, four o'clock in the morning, with um, US counterparts talking about how and where they are. On the plane is safe. Taxi, no. Airport, no, that's why you've got to have barriers uh, at the airport and in taxis and things like this. But the planes, they change the air 40 times every hour. It's really, really safe. So that's actually the good part. Apart from the communal areas, which you'll find this, if you do fly, the staff are cleaning down like frozen um, in between. So the systems, we're actually trying to work out how to open the borders again and how long people should be quarantined and all these things. So we're doing this work up at Howard Springs. And, and, and it's the idea of how often do we test people, and how do we work out who's infectious um, and where it fits? And uh, this is, again, science on the fly to actually work out what uh, is effective quarantine. So what's going to keep happening? <coughs> Good hygiene, stay away from everyone. Public gatherings will continue to be uh, a problem. Isolation and what to do when you're isolated. Um, and uh, quarantine, who needs to go in and how long? What gets more than this, we're seeing this now. Detect, track, trace and contain. We're seeing that now in Melbourne. And we've seen that across the country and that's what's actually keeping us safe at the moment. This system, there are tens of thousands of people working in this area at the moment. Um, they had to upskill, upsource and all that area. That's the sort of work I was doing when it was the swine flu. So I know exactly how intricate it is. We actually need to re-engineer our public spaces. Now I frightened the public um, health, uh, sorry, the private health insurance industry. I, done these sort of talks to just about everyone you can imagine. And the private hospital, I said, you understand day surgery doesn't work because you've got to keep cleaning everything. You can't do it. You know, if you've got, say, 12 cases coming through and short cases coming through, let's say you've got a list of cataracts or something like that, how do you keep things clean to that level that's actually in between and actually sanitising, uh, you know, people are actually apart from each other and recovery and all these things. We've built our facilities to do rapid flow-through treatment, particularly the private sector. Um, that's a real problem. How are they going to re-engineer uh, what they do? I'd like you to think about TB. So a number of you probably remember, I certainly remember TB, with a TB nurse coming around to the school and testing us, and you'd find some kid was positive, and then they'd in fact actually, suddenly that kid wasn't at school for a while, and their family was also uh, quarantined. The way we dealt with TB in hospitals, we had the active cases, acute TB, and we had the chronic TB, which we knew wasn't that infectious. And they were in different parts of the hospital, and we had different wards for those people. I see a future where we will have COVID, acute COVID wards, um, and uh, that will be a challenge for us, and in working out how we systematise elective surgery to make it safe to actually um, uh, you know, deal with those types of things. And that then goes to the other thing, like I said, with theatres and shopping centres and sports facilities, um, uh, getting confidence to actually be there and know that you're actually not going to get sick from going to one of these things. The other thing we noticed um, was supply of goods and services 60 of the 250 drugs on our national drug formula are at critical low levels. Panadol was one of those, Selbutamol, Ventolin was another. That we actually were down to the last canisters and things like this in Australia. Um, and some of that is a discussion that needs to be had about what do we make in this country and what don't we make in this country. So, the COVID police, and this is the COVID marshal of Nanimuk, as you can see with the badge. Um, and I sort of asked you to do that, and the masks have been made, it's already impregnated with viral components for you. So, uh, we will have COVID marshals um, as part of our life as we go on. You should all know this as to where it is. The sad part is we're really lagging getting through these early ones because of a lot of people are actually slowing down and supply problems and hesitancy. Um, this group down here are now starting to get agitated because they don't want to catch COVID. Why? Long COVID. So I did tell you what I talk about long COVID. We're only learning at the moment now of the health workers not the old and infirmed who got COVID in the Melbourne bus, but the health workers 
that got COVID in the, the, the bus that we had here, 25% um, um, are not back to full-time work because they still have persisting symptoms and illness from the coronavirus. That's frightening. A big study from the UK said 30% of people after that actually had neurological symptoms. Um, now that's everything from uh, depression, anxieties, right through to strokes and everything in between. Um, that's frightening, one in three. Now, we are seeing these, you don't necessarily have to end up in intensive care with this infection to actually have these complications. Um, my niece who's in Prague, she had coronavirus about eight or nine months ago and she still can't smell properly and she's still fatigued, she's 22. So this is the reality and if I was in my 18s to 20s and these are the people that are actually gonna drive the economy and everything else, I'd be immunising these people as soon as possible. We don't want them to get sick. Um, so, you know, I, I certainly applaud their enthusiasm to actually leap into this um, and in fact actually look for coverage for themselves because if a third of people who get this have longer term and persisting symptoms, that's going to have a major impact on um, what we can do with regards to um, productivity and other things like that. So this is actually over in uh, Royal Adelaide, um, just looking at the clinics and things are going to become, and testing is not going to go away uh, anytime soon. So I want to have a bit of fun with you because one of the things that are misinformation, this is the, uh, the fun bit. This one here, I love this article when it came out. COVID-19 is found in toilet paper. Strain of deadly virus breeds rapidly in tissue folders. Um, so we've actually just stopped all the virus at home. So this stuff comes through. That this is what's so good about the web. Um, now then, then the comedians come through. AstraZeneca under fighters, one of 17 million recipients gets hit by a bus after the second day. Okay, so let's put a bit of reality in the situation. Now I want to talk about the cook, the furniture salesman and the doctor. So this is me as the doctor on the project. Um, I'm really good with the rotisserie and I make a couple of desserts that um, people fight each other over but I don't put them on the web. Um, and uh, my partner and I restore uh, furniture as a hobby but we don't put that on the web either. So why are those two people putting coronavirus on there? This is, I'm a specialist public health doc and this is what I do. That's a specialty. Um, so I'm not telling them what they should do with their stuff but they're out there peddling more misinformation than you would believe and there's so many more behind them that are actually doing the same thing. And this is actually how they do their research. Um, sort of self-explanatory. Um, and this is the other one. So, hey, I know we have dedicated our whole lives to this, but this guy's comment on Facebook raises some interesting questions. <laughs> yes. Like how deluded is he? That sort of stuff. Uh, this is, you can get into trouble by saying the wrong things. Um, at the end of an interview, I actually was asked about then the Americans are only hitting around about 200,000 deaths, and I was just going, oh, yeah, that's a... Uh, that's an unmitigated disaster, I said that. Next thing you know, this meme's gone out. And thankfully he did something else he's stupid that day. This has gone all over the project of the global web. Um, people were sending it to me whilst I'm in what, what do you mean, what's Trump done? Well, he's Trump did something that trumped this, which was good, because that just disappeared. Um, but you can get into a lot of trouble. Um, and this is one of Trump's uh, treatments. We um, actually packaged it up so that people can inhale bleach a lot easier. No, I'm not putting it into the counter so that don't try this at all. Um, and this guy was very un unhappy when Trump was still president, but now he's actually got a big smile on his face. And uh, this is, you know, he can do conferences all over the world. So he, we had a conference with uh, Fauci and he was just uh, pouring praise on what we've done in Australia when he met with us, but also pointing out the, um, the, the problems that we face in the future. A couple other things just to mention. Um, pandemics equal global um, uh, insecurity. So what we're seeing with wars, insurrection, riots and other things, that's pretty standard after that. So if we don't play this vaccine rollout, we end up with a surge where people are not vaccinated and everyone suddenly wants to be vaccinated. We may see all sorts of mysterious behaviour each etching through here. That's why we need to be orderly, but we need to be fast. Um, because if I was, uh, say, 25 and uh, knew what uh, I just said about long COVID and things like that, I'd be pretty angry if I couldn't get a vaccine. And angry 25-year-olds are a lot more vigorous than angry 70-year-olds or 80-year-olds. Um, so uh, in one sense, what we're seeing is across the globe is a whole range of uh, uh, malicious behaviour that's actually occurring and accelerated. This, unfortunately, is part of pandemics. So whilst we're down with this, we just keep at it. Um, just to let you on some of the history to give you some hope. 
um, uh, I've read just about everything you possibly can about the black death. This is the first one from the 1300s. So what came after this one, which lasted about 100 and something years, um, was the Renaissance. One of the most enlightened periods of humanity ever, full stop. So, uh, and what came after the Spanish flu? The Roaring Twenties, so I just wish I was younger. Because <laughs> my uh, great aunts and uncles who did live through the Roaring Twenties said, Rob, it was wild. <laughs> okay, now, um, they were 80 when they told me that. But um, <laughs> the, the, the whole point is that we are going to have this resurgence once we've got through this, but we've probably got another year or two to actually step through what um, the repercussions of this. So, a bit of fun. Just to say, there's some science behind pandemics, and I wish we could all do it. Prevent it, predict it, detect it with the testing, respond, that's what we're really doing now. Recovery is something that no country does well. And we do that with bushfires, um, so with disasters, this is what you actually need to do, to actually do that. So recovery, recovery from drought. Um, just think about that, any sort of disaster that you've been through, recovery is something that actually is a multifaceted and it's certainly a community-led response that needs a lot of work on it. And we are, in fact, actually working with the federal government um, as their science agency on ways that we can in fact actually be a lot stronger next time uh, this comes on. Um, a nice happy uh, story here. So, dear scientist, I know that you are working so hard to create a vaccine to stop the COVID-19 virus from hurting people around the world. Thank you for all your hard work. Um, we love our admirers. They sent this down to us, uh, down to the lab, and the lab, at the darkest hour when the lab staff were all falling to pieces. Um, uh, it's letters like that actually bore them on to keep doing their work. Which is the most important thing for all of us. So as the coronavirus sinks into the sunset, I wish, <laughs> what are the reasons to be vaccinated? One, the virus is coming back. It will establish itself in this community at some stage in the future, whether planned or whether in fact inadvertently by breaking through the quarantine. Um, both of those are um, certainly breaking through the quarantine is possible, likely even. The other one is you don't want to get sick and die. So if you get a vaccine, you won't get sick and die, which is a good thing. You might get mildly ill, but you're not going to get that sick and be in intensive care or die. How many intensive care beds do we have in the Wimmera? Not many. How many staff do we have in the Wimmera? Not many. Um, and what we found in Melbourne was that half the staff get sick and stay home, and so you get even less beds. So it's not a good situation. What's my disaster plan if I caught COVID here before the vaccines were working? Get in the bloody car and get back down to Fitzroy. Um, that was my plan. Um, because uh, the chance of actually having high quality intensive care, so you want to do it for yourself. Second is, if you don't catch COVID, you can't give it to your loved ones. And if you don't give it to your loved ones, you won't be responsible for in fact making your loved ones severely ill and maybe even dying. So, you know, I love my parents, they're both 83, and uh, during the sort of lockdown period, mum, all she wanted to do, she stopped mild and all she wanted to do was hug me. And I said, mum, you can't do it, just don't. Stand back there, mum. You're not allowed to. But oh, I just want to hug you. And, yeah, I know, you're going to get your chance later on. And, and we've all gone through that sort of step. And I think that's the other point is you're trying to protect them. The next one is um, the idea of in fact actually uh, opening up the country. Um, we all like to travel, but we also need to have our trade going on, opening up our businesses, being able to go back down to the footy and cursing your team because they can't hit straight, they can't mark, and they can't win. You know, that's an Um <laughs> So you can't, you know, we've got to grab those things back and not get all those family things that we can in fact actually do with each other um, that, that we need to do and also those trips that you actually like doing and the things that you actually want to do. You can't do that if you don't get vaccinated. So that sort of sinks up into that sort of level. So they're probably the big reasons that I'd sort of say that and, and, and really I'm looking to everyone to actually keep telling the same thing. If you don't want to have this, why are you doing this? You have a moral obligation to do this. If not for yourself, but for everyone else around you. There's a whole layer of reasons that we need to do this, and we need to do this globally, which is even more important. So I'm going to finish there for questions. Yeah, well, I just want to know whether you can get a copy of this presentation at all. I want to try to copy of it. There's no words written down. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, there, are some, there are some recordings. Most are written down. <laughs> <laughs> this is also going to be available. Yeah. I've re recorded this. Yes. So this, this has been recorded uh, a number of times in many iterations. Uh, yeah. Just add more nonsense just to I get to know more nonsense. Um, and uh, you're welcome to use that in that sort of setting. I'm going to try to do a lot more community talks around the district because I'm here and I just want, I want us, again, leave out of here, we want to be 100% in this area. We're 100% with all the other immunisations. We've got to be 100% with this one as well. We should have a competition um, and, uh, and, and drive it. <laughs> If you've had
had COVID, do you need the vaccination? Yeah. The sad thing about um, the COVID infection is it doesn't seem to give you immunity for very long. Although, the next time you get it with another variant, you don't get that sick. Mm. However, it's been suggested that you should just have the vaccine. Because it's so volatile at the moment and changing, um, you're far better to do that. What the vaccine does is it gives you actually a stronger immunity through the T cells. You know, there, there's the immunoglobulins, that's okay, but that's not what we were looking for. We were looking for T cells. And the T cells are in fact actually stronger in the vaccine than the actual natural disease. We don't understand it, but either in one sense, the, the important thing is everyone should get vaccinated. And if you're looking for variant ones in the new year. Um, I've got a friend who she's in her early 70s, and she's sort of from the factor five in blood clotting and a whole family. And she wants to have the injection, but she's scared that something will trigger her. Hmm. What's her chance? It's funny, you, you must, I, 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 I went up to grab from Doc Sutherland in Nagmark, he did, did all these beautiful family trees, and so we had a couple of anti-lidons and factifiers and uh, others in the, in the community, so it may well be the German heritage that came across with the, the Lutherans that came through, I don't know yeah. where, where that fitted, but they were all um, generally good German names. Um, yeah. Now, uh, the most easiest way to do that is talk to your specialist or your doctor. Um, I've spoken to a lot of hematologists and others, and they said, uh, immunise, it doesn't seem to be a risk factor. However, for people to, um, to put their mind at ease, it's most important to talk it through with your doctor and make sure you're comfortable with it for anyone who's got those sort of questions in my advice. When I was a kid, they had uh, quarantine stations on islands and I would love, love to see them. I would like to see two lots of two weeks plus on islands, not in the CBDs. Yeah, but yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting, interesting problem because uh, a trip down to the Point of Queen, say for a public health office, is a big thrill. Okay, and you can read all the history and understand what, what they did. Point of Queen saved us um, from many things, from the Gold Rush times to others, and what we used to do was we burnt the ships in Port Phillip Bay until they were given a clearance for cholera and things like that. Yeah. Now, the government had this bet about how long was this going to go on for, and I think most people were in disbelief because to build a quarantine centre would cost money, but with hindsight, you would have said, well, it would have paid for itself over and over and over and over again. Howard Springs is unbelievable, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and I've got a team up there, as I said, and uh, with hindsight, I'm sure most of the state governments are kicking themselves saying we should have done this, um, we should have done this early on. Uh, so you, you, you're quite right. And North Head in Sydney, same deal, protected Australia when we had the, through the colonial times. Yeah, Rob, uh, just, uh, is there a blood test you can see that you've had COVID? You sort of said some people have symptoms going on and on, um, and some people might realise they have COVID, but they have these symptoms that they can't diagnose. Is there a blood test to say that you've actually had mm. with COVID? And, yep. uh, just a positive test, is it? So there's a number of tests that we can do, yes. and, and that's trying to work out how accurate they are and how helpful they are. Yep. So we can look at various antibodies. Um, so if you go back to when HIV came around, how we didn't really know when we were doing that Western blot, which is a bit of a, you know, dodgy test in the best instance and now we'd say someone with HIV we've got all these amazing tests that can actually give us a whole sequence of where they are with the infection. We're not quite there with COVID yet but we've moved really fast. There's a whole range of even just blood tests from drops of blood that are actually coming through. We're working with a number of companies that are working at that level. Um, the PCR tends to work off nasal secretions but we've also been doing antigen tests. So the antigen test says you've got active virus as opposed to PCR says they are genomic parts so you may or may not be infectious. Yeah, that's yeah, the weakness that's, of that. Yeah, yeah. So, so they've all got their pluses and minuses. The antibody's a good one to see have you actually been exposed before. Right. Yeah. yeah. And the, the, those long-term people that have symptoms and whatnot, there's sort of no treatment. They're just uh, symptomatic. Yeah, you probably, um, again, in how it springs, some of the people who said that they've had it, we did antibody tests and, and there was no evidence they had. Mm. So, so if people's perceptions of what they've had yeah. versus what they've actually had are different. <laughs> You mentioned those nasal sprays. How, how is that going to work? Is it going to be separate to the injections or is it going to be in conjunction with the injections? So when we, when we did that study in Ferris and it worked so well, Oxford started doing it in people and they're still completing that study in the UK. So what, they, what you might find is the first AstraZeneca shot will be an injection and the second will be a nasal squirt. Um, and that would be really handy. Um, there are other full nasal Vaccines coming through. Would that work with the Pfizer one as well? No, because not because of the way it actually uh, works on your immune system. So the, the, the nasal 
afraid, it's unlikely to work with those known. Yeah. Yeah, it's unlikely to work with them um, to work through. But with the viral ones, uh, yes, it would. Okay. But it's exciting. I mean, think of Sagan um, and and, uh, and, uh, and Salk, the two polio ones, ones in ones in mm -hmm. and ones that mm -hmm. drops on the tongue. Um, it's ways of actually looking at how to do mass vaccination. So one of our smart scientists decided, why don't we just try this sub study as well on, on looking at nasal spray? Because the virus gets up your nose and attached to the nasal mucosa. It doesn't attach anywhere else. And so if we can block that, and we're actually looking at some drugs that actually block. So um, how, long, how far away is that? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. I know that the study is um, progressing. Um, and they tend not to break those studies so that people are blinded so you don't get influenced by what's happening to it. So hopefully soon, because that would save the problem in the third world. Let's imagine it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, um, makes, it makes one more attractive than the other. Sure does. <laughs> <laughs> yep. When we're trying to explain to people the uh, the difference between the, the blood clots, what, what's the difference in the blood clots? Because if someone, you sort of say to someone, get the AstraZeneca, it's a different blood clot than the normal, say, PE or something like that. So how do we explain that? To this is a particularly rare and unusual blood clot that occurs in the big veins at the base of your brain. Um, and it was alarming when these things first started to appear. Um, and uh, then it was an issue of, is it above the normal community rate? Um, and where does it fit? So we know that that particular blood clot occurs with COVID at a, at a quite a high rate. Um, and it's a matter of actually uh, how often does it occur with the vaccine. There are other clots in other areas. So the PE is the common one in your leg that usually floats up to your lungs. Um, and that occurs extremely commonly through many, many things, as you know. I mean, you, know, you have knee surgery and things like that, it's a high risk. Yeah. I think it's like one in 200. Um, now, there's another one, the portal vein, the one going into the liver. And, and that actually also uh, has an increase with COVID um, vaccines as well. They're not all, none of them are free of the clotting risk. It's just a matter of degrees as to where the clotting risk fits with all of these vaccines. Now, to understand that is the coronavirus, as I said, causes you to clot to death. And so it's not unexpected that a vaccine working on your immune system will in fact actually modulate that to the degree. The question was making sure it wasn't in fact actually a very prominent side effect um, in that setting. So where would we fit with this one? The chances of catching that clot um, in Australia, our ex Australian experience, but global experience, is around about um, one to two per 100,000. That's to get the clot. But we've got great healthcare systems and we also got great diagnosis now to look out for it. So as I said, the current figures that came out yesterday, 0.5 per million died from this clot, which is really, really actually very good. So in one sense, it's being alert to how bad is a headache. I had the AstraZeneca headache. I feel crap all the time because I've been doing this job. Um, so um, when I had the vaccine, I felt just crap. I just didn't know more crap than that, I just from work. Um, <laughs> but the headache is a beauty, isn't it? You, you, you've got two headache sufferers here. It's an absolute clanger and you're going, oh, I've got the blood clot. So everyone, my daughter's now an um, intern down at Casey. And she said, Dad, I have done more CT scans than you could ever imagine. Because everyone comes in with a headache and they want to have a scan. How about the clot? Yeah. 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 And the so treatment's the same, is it? Yeah. The treatment's the same. The treatment's the same, go home and take some Panadol. That would be a good start. No, for the clot. Yeah, anyone, who gets, for the clot. anyone who gets it, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the treatment for the clot's the same. But anyone who gets a headache, yeah. uh, it would be a good idea yeah. to consider the idea of actually trying a Panadol first yeah. um, <laughs> before you, in fact, go for a CT scan. I've got one at the back, though. Oh, okay. I was actually um, about people. So back in the 70s, there were a couple of embryonic stem cells that were derived in the um, pharmaceutical industry. And believe it or not, in fact, a lot of the cell culture work that we do actually comes from donors. Um, there's, um, there's one cell line that we use in a lot of cancer therapeutics which come from a, a woman's um, cervical cancer cells, which actually, these cells are actually replicated and shared in laboratories all around the world for actually doing the insights. So it's a, it's a, it's a once or a twice off in this sort of embryonic stage, two embryos donated their cells, um, obviously not with consent because they're embryos, um, but they have in fact actually led to um, thousands of health advances mm -hmm. for, for, for the globe. And in particular with these cells, the way they're used, they're actually used to increase the amount of adenovirus um, and then they're extracted out. So the vaccine has no stem cells in it. Mm -hmm. 
and it's actually pure. It's pure antigen in the in the viral area. That's that that that's um, certainly the categorical part to do that. So how does someone um, fit into that one? They may well need to think about it in the moral sense of um, these were two embryos that have benefited the whole of um, humanity, and um, and at some stages we need to consider that there are no stem cells in the vaccine itself, um, and that's. I mean, it's, it's challenging, but if people understood about where a lot of their medications had come from in that sense, about how they're used and where they are, um, uh, they, they might be challenged with those things as well. Um, I think coronavirus is a lot worse than um, worrying about that, but I won't question people's moral beliefs. If you were going to give us a lot of hope after you had the infusion, how soon time factor that you would Around about um, the 10 to 14 day mark. Up to the 10 to 14 day mark. question to us as, a, as to why we haven't been able to crack the idea of having a reliable um, contraceptive for men. That's probably the main, main reason. The pill, is, as you probably all gathered, has actually allowed you to step out from time and just visit your local cemetery. I, I do that. I take people out to the Natty Cemetery and see eight kids, ten kids and died with the last one. It doesn't happen nowadays. Um, and that's really what contraception's done for us and allowed you to stay at work and allowed you to space your kids and things. So you look at the pluses and minuses of uh, of contraception. Um, it's really a personal issue of how much risk you want to take with um, with those. Um, people who smoke, sure, they, they really have no right to argue with it, Claudine. Um, but on the other side of with the pill, the answer is, yeah, we should have research into male contraceptives. Um, I'm talking the female, like, realistically. I'm talking about the product that's there, yeah. not about whether the bloke's going to do it or not. But for a woman taking that pill, like, this has raised an issue that's probably been not that highlighted. Well, they're all variable. It depends on the level of the estrogen, really. So a lot of the progesterone only's are terrific. So the progesterone only uh, implants are fantastic because they, um, like zero coppers, the marinas and things like that. So um, there has been a move to decreasing those amounts. But you're right. Uh, there'll be a more awareness to side effects of medication. Hopefully, people will do it. Uh, you don't want to know the side effects of your cancer treatments. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> yep. um, on the AAC news last week, they just said, for example, if you had the AstraZeneca vaccine and then had the Pfizer later on, if you had a better immunity, what do you think about that? Uh, not proven. Not proven at this stage. Mm -hmm. um, and probably at this stage, best to actually stay with the same one. Um, so uh, uh, there's no solid scientific evidence to support that either way. Not yet. Not yet. You've been talking about the AstraZeneca one, but how do you make a decision which way to go? For us? Is it, and, and do things like if you've got a compromised immune system, is there one that's better than the other? They're both great with compromised immune systems, as has been shown across millions of doses globally. Um, the choice is really on the issue of what's available. Um, we've got an outbreak that looks like it's starting in Melbourne now. We don't know if that'll get brought under control, probably will, um, but it's only a matter of time before we have another one. And the question then is, can you risk it by not having a vaccine now to give you some immunity um, uh, whilst you sit back and wait? Um, because it's going to be a mad rush when we do have the outbreak and people are going, oh my God, now I better have it now. And they'll be running around trying to find uh, where they can book in and where they can actually get the immunisation. That's the big worry I've got. At the moment, we've got the luxury of, um, yeah, do it, um, because it's, it can be nice and peaceful and orderly. 
Is there any, like, we, we hear all about AstraZeneca and, and the blood clots and whatnot, what about Pfizer? Like, what about the other side effect from the other vaccines? Is yep. there any... Um, well, they no all have, they, 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 yeah, yeah, no, that's right. They all have blood clots as a problem. They do? Yeah, oh. it's less. There you go. <laughs> By one point for me. <laughs> Which, of course, is again, how many lightning strike deaths? Yeah. <laughs> 50. 50 lightning strike deaths equals the clot uh, from the AstraZeneca, all right? Um, that's the important factor to remember. And the other one is, okay, the rule of nines. What's your likelihood yeah. of dying over 75? One in nine. One in ninety over fifty, and one in nine hundred over thirty. But it says political side to all of what's happening as well in terms of quarantine and people, um, you know, making opening up the borders and re-entry and all of that. I, I'm, I'm kind of a bit horrified about how some of that has really been handled because that's where the infections are coming from at the moment in the outbreaks. Really. We'll have a Royal Commission um, when this is all over. And oh, well, oh, oh, that's... <laughs> 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 I, sort of, I sort of work for the government, so I won't publicly say... I know you work for the government, <laughs> and, and it's just unfortunate that it seems that the health arm doesn't necessarily align very well with the... Uh, other arm. <laughs> well, let's just say Fauci's job was worse with Trump yes, than, 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 than Brendan exactly. Murphy's has been with, exactly. uh, with Morrison. He comes back. Yeah, it was the thunderstorm forecast. Which one? At the golf course. Ah, <laughs> good question. Um, the other guy, the other guy was at East Geelong, not on the same day. He was he went under a tree when a storm came through. Now, oh. it's sheet lightning, Bowen Heads. If you know the Bowen Heads golf course, it's really pretty flat, um, and it's right on the cliff. Edge. The coast is really quite nice. I did my training at Geelong Hospital and so I lived at Bowen Heads. Why would you live in Geelong? <laughs> um, and we had no warning of a thunderstorm coming through. We actually had overcast and then we started to get misty rain and then we were standing on the tee and then all of a sudden it was bull. Um, there's four of us, the plastic surgeon, um, the medical administrator and two residents. And uh, I had my umbrella in my hand. Oh. <laughs> the umbrella hit me on the back of the head. The plastic surgeon had, uh, was lying over his clubs like this, going, bloody hell. Um, um, the other registrar had just pulled the club out, and this, so there's sparks. <laughs> Did it hurt? Uh, it's a silly question. No, no, but sheet, sheet lightning's, you know, sort of, oh, yeah. yeah, it just means everything's sort of just electrostatic, but we're, so fork lightning's really bad news, and, you know, we've got farm tractors and all sorts of great things out here as lightning conductors in the paddocks. So you're quite right. Uh, when they when they predicted we should be inside Singapore. I was just checking the expert that's leading the um, <laughs> pandemic um, about your risk management because um, <laughs> I don't go on the tractor when there's lightning. Like, um, <laughs> <laughs> and I've done it before, babe. Um, we were picking up square bales yeah. and the storm yeah. came in, and we thought, no, nah, we're out. Yeah. And by the time we got home, it hit where we would have been, yeah. and that was. Straight down. So I was just wondering how your risk management is <laughs> <laughs> out there with the It's very important. It was the resident versus consultants golf match. So <laughs> very important. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just um, on different um, reactions to the vaccine doesn't mean that you've got say I had I had no reaction. I maybe had a headache yep. a few days later, but that was more the flu shot two weeks later that but my partner had it and she went down early. So it doesn't Here, really mean... Does it mean that I've got less of a... a no. 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 Exactly. Certainly you are, you've, you've had the dose. It's a, they're very effective. We, we've been overwhelmed by the fact that we've had not only one, but um, five different vaccine platforms um, have been affected with coronaviruses where we've never had a coronavirus vaccine for humans before. Just goes to show what we can do when the world focuses on one thing. Um, a, bit, a bit like the moonshot, you know, when, uh, when Kennedy said we're going to put people on the moon and then they did. Um, it was like we're going to develop a coronavirus vaccine where we actually develop five platforms. So some of the other ones, Gen 2s and Gen 3s coming through, we're doing work um, on particularly the Anovio one which we work with. That's a DNA vac um, vaccine, so a different platform again. Um, are absolutely stunning um, in, the, in the trials. It's in phase three at the moment and uh, we're doing variant tweaking for them. It's exciting. Well, the information, like I said, that you've 
three kids on a burglary <coughs> right. These are just things that people are saying, so I knew I had just yep. as much protection as anybody else. You do. And I actually work in Melbourne Uni, and um, my partner works at Peter Doherty ah. with the ferrets, with the whole thing. Excellent. So we're trying to spread the word and calm people down mm -hmm. and sort of encouraging people that the signs <coughs> are good, you know, you, you communicate that rather than, I don't try and, uh, I'll try and sort of let people know these sort of facts without pushing it, you know, to the further. But I think everybody would benefit from actually listening to someone like you. Mm -hmm. And hearing it, <laughs> I've seen you on the news and I've seen all the good stuff on the news as well as we see all the idiots that they give time to. And it just infuriates me when you see the, the actual rubbish that gets out there. Because that's why people aren't getting vaccinated. And like you said, we need all the negative um, yeah. dogs about that, and, uh, and it is, you know, yeah. and when you work, as I said, I'm lucky, I, I work alongside people and I've seen lots of different, you know, um, Ian Fraser, I worked with Ian Fraser up in um, yeah. Queensland, things like that, you know, and just the number of people that have been saved by these different vaccinations. Mm -hmm. Yes, some get side effects, but as they... You get side effects from all yeah, But that's right, you sure need to put it up there in neon signs, I think, sometimes. If we did nothing, if we did nothing, um, and we wouldn't have done nothing, because the population would have actually isolated themselves if we stayed at Bolsonaro or South Prime Minister, um, we uh, would have lost about 160,000 Australians. That's sort of the reality. We wouldn't have lost that many because people would have realised, I'm not going down to shops, I'm not yeah. going out. So, because people aren't stupid. Um, but that's the sort of figures that we would have been looking at. That was the early predictions we were looking at figures um, to do that. So that's how strongly we've got. We haven't even lost a thousand Australians. Amazing. Down the back. Uh, yep, another one I've heard is the word thalidomide. Mm. So, other than it's not the same, it's, it's something, and the person that said it to me was, I felt slightly past childbearing age to be worried about thalidomide. Um, is there, that's just what I want to address specifically with people because it's obviously the one like a particularly scary mm. drug that would so the college of owen your mum was almost described the for when she was pregnant with me yeah um and uh that's sort of what it was like in the 60s wasn't it um i don't one... know i wasn't there yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my, mum, my mum sort of says that to me now and again about, about where it was um so the College of ONG site has got lots of plain English written there about what to do and answers to a lot of those common questions, so they really are easy to understand. So I'd sort of urge you to look at the um, Ramskov um, site uh, for looking at those things. When it first came through was what do we do with breastfeeding, what do we do with pregnancy, what do we do with thinking of pregnancy. So with pregnancy, um, a number of women in the trials, a number of women have inadvertently been given the vaccine whilst they are unknowingly pregnant and they, no one has had any evidence of any abnormal pregnancies from this stage. But no one's going to stick in their head at saying it's safe. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll say it's safe when the college um, actually says that they're satisfied that it's in fact actually safe in that area. Considering pregnancy, um, there's no contraindication. Um, however, the college went to say that if, if a woman had potential to have severe complications to coronavirus and living in active community transmission, they'd recommend vaccination. Um, Breastfeeding, um, there is no evidence, and certainly from these platforms, that this would be transmitted through the breast milk. Um, and if you'd had COVID, you will transmit the antibodies to COVID through breast milk. So that'll probably help you a bit. But Sorry, again, there is evidence you will transmit immunity, or you won't. You will so transmit the immunoglobulins, yeah. in, okay? Um, my question, and it's from the Rebecca Hill site, <laughs> no, Norman and I converse a lot um, on, on the secret channel because it's, it, I have to vent. So I listen to every Corona cast. And, and he's like, from Edinburgh, so his language is unbelievable. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so the question was around um, treatments for COVID, and he was talking about Keprin um, mm. being possibly a treatment of the snake and It's good that he's pushing that because I've been working.